We have Dr. Ajang Jamali uh, uh, giving us a talk. Well, um, you guys are the current and future leaders of transplantation and nephrology. So for me, it is not only a fun exercise, but an important one to talk to you today about this uh, topic. I also want to thank GLOMCON and thank the leaders, including Dr. Ali Pujanmer, Dr. Kasim Safa, who kindly introduced me, and Dr. Mario Rubin, who originally invited me almost about a year ago. So without further ado, uh, this is my disclosure slide. I am currently, in, related to this talk, a member of the advisory board for CARE-DX and also a member of the steering committee for the IMAGINE clinical trial for antibody-mediated rejection. My objectives for all of you, for all of us, would be to discuss and understand the definition of, uh, the current definition of ABMR, uh, how we diagnose it, what are the current treatment strategies, and what are some of the main limitations in both the diagnosis and treatment of AMR. I would like to start with a case that uh, happened about 10 years ago when I was in Wisconsin. It was a 50-year-old or so gentleman, uh, kidney transplant recipient on maintenance immunosuppression with mycophenolate and prednisone, presented with a rise in his serum creatinine over time, checked his, his antibodies and determined that he had the robo DSA of class two around 20,000, so high MFI levels at least at our institution. We did a biopsy, didn't really show much interstitial inflammation, tubulitis, arteritis, but had mild glomerulitis, peritubular capillaritis, and microvascular inflammation score of two, moderate C4D thinning, minimal hyalinosis, but advanced or severe transplant glomerulopathy, and uh, some mild chronic interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy for an overall chronic chronicity score of five. We didn't really know what to do. And at that stage, the overall thought was, okay, maybe just optimize baseline immunosuppression, which is what we did. His microphenolate, which was at 360 twice a day, was increased to full dose. And we reintroduced tacrolimus, which was originally added because <clears throat> it was thought that it was going to um, be nephrotoxic. But unfortunately, what happened is that this uh, gentleman lost uh, his allograft, but a year after that uh, biopsy. So what we are going to talk about today is what I call the triple aim for kidney transplantation. I don't think that anyone would argue that if we could achieve this goal, we would really achieve or reach the holy grail in transplantation. People talk about the holy grail being tolerance, but I'm not as optimistic or as ambitious. I would say if we can achieve the goal of one kidney transplant for life, optimal immunosuppression, that is no rejection, but of course, no infections, no cancer. So in other words, precision medicine and no kidney allograft biopsy in a scenario where we don't have to really uh, proceed with invasive processes, that would be a huge achievement. With that in mind, let's move forward and, and, and determine what is really antibody-mediated rejection. The terminology is quite specific and it includes antibodies, so antibodies here, uh, that mediate rejection. This rejection can be either direct through antigen antibody interactions. These antigens are primarily HLA peptides that are presented on the surface of endothelial cells. So a direct pathway, activation of endothelial cell resulting in cell proliferation and ending in fibrosis if the repair process is not appropriate or through an indirect pathway. The indirect pathway will require either the complement, hence the deposition of C4D as a footprint of rejection, or it will be complement independent. And this is uh, a process in which you have peritubular capillaritis or glomerulitis through recruitment of PMNs, um, monocyte macrophages, or NK cells. These are all processes that require the presence of 
antibodies in terms of the interactions with the antigen on the surface 